are on another new, very substantial car test drive. Welcome to the all new Aston Martin DBS. Now, for those words to be coming out of my mouth, it's personally significant because DBS for me has always been my favorite Aston Martin. The previous generation, I think particularly in manual format, there is a timeless quality about that car that resonated with me from day one. And when I saw that they were reigniting the DBS name, I got all giddy and excited because I thought, this is the next generation, things have evolved massively, Aston as a company has evolved massively, and they're going to be basing it on the DB11, which as a platform to base your foundation of your DBS on, <laughs> is absolutely awesome. So what are we in? Well, uh, as I mentioned, it's based on the DB11, but this has now had a plethora of substantial upgrades that constitutes the DBS. So power is upped. We are now 715 brake horsepower, but more significantly, 660 pounds feet of torque. And that's what you get out of this new era of turbocharged engines. So it's still running the 5.2 liter V12, but of course it is heavily twin turbocharged, hence all of that torque. And of course the DBS moniker as well is all about performance. Nought to 60 is in the mid three seconds. I think officially it's around about 3.4 seconds. But believe me, when you apply foot to floor, this thing seriously, seriously churns. It's like a fast wash of torque. This car as well is 72 kilograms lighter than the DB11. Just immerse you in some of that V12. So it revs up to seven. Which granted, in this day and age of competitors like the 812 Superfast, which revs out to 9,000, isn't as high as you might like it, but it makes up for it in that vast amount of torque. But the biggest differences by far is just how taut and tight and on its toes this car feels with the revisions that Aston have made to the suspension. The camber is more aggressive on both front and rear wheels and tires and together with that carbon fiber prop and mechanical diff I can't tell you how different it feels from a DB11 even the DB11 AMR which I've recently driven it just turns in like a different car I did find that on the DB11 particularly slightly less so on the AMR but particularly the DB11 there was this sort of softer feeling about it. it had this softer aura that it was very much pure and simple a Grand Tourer this is very much more now a Super GT and for all of its power and performance I guess one of its greatest party tricks is that while you can really get on it I would say it's just as much at home when you find yourself behind a very slow van and you need to chill wonderful now speaking of chill this is where the gearbox situation comes in now for me and again I know I go on about it and if you are a regular uh, viewer of this channel you will know that I'm a big fan of twin clutch gearboxes particularly if you're going to be mating them in performance cars I still class this as a performance car Aston definitely class this as a performance car it's the most powerful road going Aston Martin they've ever made and while all of these revisions like a carbon fiber prop shaft mechanical limited slip differential heavier camber on the wheels just a tighter sharper front end you would think that in this day and age they would have made it a more responsive box to the car on the upshifts look it's fine upshifts are okay in fact upshifts are great so the downshifts under heavier braking you pull a paddle and then you kind of wait a bit for it to change gear. Now it might not sound like it to you, but when you're driving it, you have to remember that our brains work so quickly that what is 0.2 of a second on paper feels like an eternity when you pull that paddle and your brain is expecting and anticipating it to shift down a gear. Now, this is where I say it's a funny one when it's paired with this car because it is still a Grand Tour. But Aston are positioning this car against cars like the Bentley Continental GT and they've openly written about it going head to head with the 812 Superfast. 
I'm sorry, the gearbox just isn't up to it. But where I'm gonna cut this thing some slack is the fact that it does very much lend itself to the character of a Grand Tourer. And while the 812 does tour grandly, this, I would say, tours even better. It's just an all-round softer car. While it is a lot more focused and poised and taut compared to platforms such as the DB11 and even the DB11 AMR, ultimately, when you really get up it, despite its huge straight-line punch, I would say it's the last sort of 20% of dynamic ability that does sort of reinforce that, actually, for all of its aggressive prowess and incredible styling, it does have a slightly softer nature. And Aston themselves are quite open when I mentioned it to them. They said that, look, these cars are designed to be approached by people of all driving abilities. But your aim is to get in this car and have a great time and make you feel like a hero if you're not up for driving something that have 715 horsepower to the rear wheels alone. You can get in this thing, grab it by the scruff of its neck, and you'd be smiling all day long. So look at that front end. The front, honestly, the biggest difference for me, it sounds better, but the front end, and particularly when you're trailing it in and you throw a bit of extra weight on that nose into these tight hairpins, it really just eats into the tarmac and sucks itself through these super tight corners. It's a great feeling. And I'm particularly impressed because fresh in my mind, the last car I drove from Aston Martin was the DB11 AMR. And while that is a lovely step on and a you know substantial evolution from the DB11, it really did feel like a DB11. This does feel like its own car. You're aware that the underpinnings are DB11, but there's something about its prowess, the way that it turns in, the way that it flows through corners. It does disguise its weight very well. That I'm impressed with. That I'm not. Sorry, Aston, I know, but this is your flagship car, and the other two competitors in this space have managed to put in a, a twin clutch box. It's the kind of thing that I love, still a fabulous driving experience. I just think it's when you're really, really on it that it's only the downshifts that give it this more relaxed nature. Now, speaking of relaxed nature, let's face it, I conveniently find myself right now on a tight, twisty, empty Alpine Pass, and that's encouraging me to brake later and downshift harder and downshift later, and I think that might be highlighting it to me. But honestly, most of the time you're going to be dailying this car, it would make an unbelievable cross-continental cruiser. This thing would eat miles like you wouldn't believe. It's such a comfortable but ergonomically sporty driving position. You don't get in it and think and you grand tour it immediately. It does encourage you to get up it and explore its dynamics and its power. But when you want to settle down and cruise, put it into some higher gears, it's gorgeous. It's absolutely stunning. So let's talk about the styling. I know aesthetics are subjective, but I don't care. This thing is unbelievable. It's one of the greatest looking cars I've seen in a long, long time. When I first had the honor of talking to Marek Reichman and Miles from Aston Martin's design team, they pulled the cover off it, my jaw hit the floor. The front grille, it's got a lot of, I would say, Zagato-esque DNA in it. It's very menacing. I saw one drive up behind me earlier, and I was driving this, and even I wanted to get out of the way. It just has such a lot of road presence. Now, interestingly, they brought back the Superleggera moniker, which I think was last used on what is classed now as their more classic cars, like the DB5, DB6, etc. Now it's interesting that they should bring that moniker back because Superleggera kind of is synonymous with lightweight and lightweight it kind of is not. At around about an 1800 kilogram curb weight, it's no ballet dancer. However, we definitely are not gonna knock Aston Martin for applying it because it's also synonymous with their heritage and partnerships in coachwork. Coachwork design of very special bespoke cars of the past. And I think because this car looks so good, it gets away with wearing it. And you know, while the car itself isn't actually lightweight, it's 72 kilograms lighter, so not a huge amount, but there's still a lot of carbon fiber bodywork in play here 
and I think that definitely does help the way that this thing fluidly swims through corners. So some stats, we all love some stats, don't we? To contextualize power, 0 to 60, 3.4 seconds. But one of the big ones is 0 to 100, 0 to 100 in 6.4 seconds. That's unbelievable, like that is some serious poke. Now I can't experience that on these roads because there's only short straights between each corner. I'm just gonna drop this down to second now while we have a burst, are you ready? The torque, that's the thing. Where it lacks revs, it makes up for in buckets of torque, and that's the stuff. Like, torque is, is sort of twisting effort. It's the thick feeling of power underneath your foot, and it's the stuff that compresses you in your seat. That's the feeling of thrust, and it has so much of it. 660 pounds feet, not newton meters, pounds feet. No wonder they need a carbon fiber prop shaft in this thing. It would snap in half if they didn't. It's fabulous, and components like a carbon shaft allows for it to spin up a bit more freely. So it does have this freer revving movement about it when you do drop a cog and plant your foot. It is a very satisfying feeling. And of course, what would an Aston Martin be if it wasn't for a resplendent interior? There's one thing that Aston are fantastic at and it's aesthetics, both interior and exterior. The interior on this, there's so many intricate details. The stitching, the paneling, the layers of leather with these beautiful red piping through areas which you just wouldn't expect. And it's all molded and tied together nicely with sculpted carbon. Now, similar to the Vantage, which I had the honor of spending three months with, uh, the suspension and uh, drivetrain controls are exactly the same. On the left-hand side of the wheel, you have three damper control settings. When you just start it up, it's in what I would class as comfort. You press it one more time, and it goes to sport mode. And then one more time, and it goes to sport plus mode, which, as the name would suggest, is generally a stiffer driving experience. On the road, just normal is brilliant. Even flowing through these tight corners, I, I've never felt that I needed it to be more stiff. Having said that, when you do press it and it does just, just stiffen up a little bit more, it's a nice feeling. As long as the road isn't too bumpy, which fortunately this isn't, it does just take the edge off what subtle body roll that there was and iron it out so that you can have maximum attack on these 90 degree hairpins. And then on the right hand side, you've got your sport button. And what DBS wouldn't be complete without your sport button? And what does it do? Similar thing, really. When you start it up, it's in the more conventional GT mode, which is steady throttle, a bit more relaxed shift pattern. Press it one more time, sport mode. I believe shift speed is increased and throttle response even more so. And then you've got sport plus, which might as well be called track, and everything's just a little bit more aggressive. To be honest with you, the difference between sport and sport plus isn't dramatic. It is a nice jump from standard to sport. I would kind of drive it in sport most of the time, but so when you activate both of these things and put suspension in sport, drivetrain in sport, it just comes into its own and you're reminded that you are in something quite spicy. Also contributing to that overall steadier driving experience is the adaptive suspension has been dropped by 5mm. It doesn't sound much aesthetically, it's quite pleasing seeing a car dropped by 5mm. It just brings the arch gap between the tyre and the arch themselves just that little bit closer and gives it a sportier stance. But overall, I always say that these things are often greater than the sum of their parts. If we add up everything that we've just spoken about, it really has made up a really complete driving focus Grand Tourer. It's not ultra sharp, but that's not what it's supposed to be. It's just supposed to be a very dynamic Grand Tourer. For me now, this truly is a super GT. Look at that turn, I mean, we are pushing on there and it's not an ounce of understeer at what I can clarify as a swift pace. <laughs> as swift as you'd want. And it gives you a lot of confidence. And that's the most important thing. I guess the majority of people who are buying these, you know, you might not be after throwing a car at 10 tenths into the tightest corners on the Alps. But what you do want is just something with a bit of a dynamic edge that when you do want to get up it and you do find yourself attacking a wonderful, empty, free-flowing road like this one, it's gonna reward you in buckets. I think this... <laughs> T. 
ticks the box big time. So please let me know in the comments below anything else you want to know about this car. I have a funny feeling that this will not be the last time that I get to drive this wonderful machine. I'd love to spend much longer with it on a longer journey to really explore particularly its Grand Tourer characteristics. If you can let me know in the comments below and I shall do my very best to provide the information in future videos. As always guys, thanks for watching. I see you next time. Ciao!